Hello, America. I'm Lyle Rapaki reporting for Prescott E! News in Prescott, Arizona, and this is Arizona Today. I have a very special and unique guest today. Instead of some of the political people that you're becoming accustomed to me interviewing and sharing time with, I have a very good friend and someone I've known many years, although his hair hasn't turned gray, mine has, uh, Rabbi Jack Zimmerman of Jewish Voice. Rabbi, thank you so much for spending time with us. Lyle, it's an honor, and you would be amazed what good hair color can do. <laughs> did, did I say that? Uh, blessing to be with you, my friend. <laughs> I met Rabbi Jack 20, 30, 50 years ago, I don't remember, years ago. And um, this is going to be a very special and unique show, and I'm very glad you're tuned in, and I'm very glad that uh, Rabbi Jack is here with us today. Uh, Rabbi, uh, you are with Jewish Voice, and you are the staff evangelist for Jewish Voice yes. uh, International. How does that work? How does a rabbi be involved in uh, evangelism and Judaism all interchanged? It's a great question, and, and Jewish Voice Ministries is a Jewish organization that recognizes something very, very Jewish, that Jesus or Yeshua is the promised Jewish Messiah. I've been with the organization now, this October will be 17 years. And being an evangelist essentially means going out and sharing the good news with the Jewish people and with the nations, as, as we call him Rabbi Shaul or the Apostle Paul tells us in Romans 1.16. That's what I do for the ministry, and, and I guess a, a catch statement would be that there, that there is no greater way to be Jewish and understand your Jewish heritage than to identify with the Jewish Messiah. There's this misnomer that, well, what in the world would a Jew have to do with Jesus? Because as everyone knows, Jesus was this blonde-haired, blue-eyed Norwegian <laughs> who um, basically spoke with a British accent in every Phil Lane feature film and had no Jewishness about him. And what's happened over the past 2,000 years is the Jewishness that he indeed always had has been stripped out of the Bible, and part of what we do is to restore the original intent of the Scriptures. Now, was that, you grew up, uh, I apologize. Okay, no, no, you don't have to. Okay. I did grow up. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, that, We're gonna find. again, I, I've known this man a long time. I'm fine. You grew up Orthodox? Uh, uh, conservative uh, Jewish? Conservative Jewish. Okay, so you grew up conservative Jewish, and, and as you matured um, uh, physically, mentally, and all that, and then also theologically, you moved over to accept the Jesus, Yeshua, of Judaism. In other words, he was a Jew. That's right. And he came for the Jews. Yes. Okay, I just want to make sure I've got this right for, for all of us. Yep. And, and so you moved in that direction. That had to be quite interesting, uh, leaving Orthodox or conservative Judaism to become Messianic. Little did I realize that this was a 30-year plan of God in process. Um, I uh, married a Christian girl, and she knew more about my Jewish Bible, the Old Testament, than I did. And early on in our marriage, she began to share with me verses in my Bible that spoke about who the promised Messiah was. She didn't mention a name. And as she's bringing up these verses to me, I didn't know them. And, and she said, well, you're Jewish, don't you know these? I say, the vast majority of our Jewish people, we don't read our Bibles, even though it's the story of our history, our Moses, our David, our Joseph, etc. And And she showed me verses such as, Isaiah 7, 14, therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign, a virgin shall conceive, bear a son, call his name Emmanuel. Uh, verses like in Psalm 22, where it says, my tongue cleaves to my mouth, all my bones are out of joint, evil ones have surrounded me, they've pierced my hands and feet. So I'm seeing in my Jewish Bible a story of a Messiah who would be born of a virgin, crucified, and who in Daniel chapter 9 would have to come the first time before the destruction of the second temple. All anyone has to do is read the word of God. You can come to no other conclusion than the fact that Jesus, Yeshua, his Hebrew name, was, is, and always will be the promised Messiah of all. So you read and read and studied and studied and yeah. slowly migrated, and then you, a, a Jew, hang in there with me, okay? Oh, yeah. Okay. You, a Jew, accepted the Jewish Messiah. That's right. Yeshua or Jesus. Yes. Okay. 
And that started a whole new life for you, in a way. And that started a whole new argument in my family, <laughs> too. Uh, my, I'll my, bet it did. <laughs> my, my parents were not at all happy. They said things, well, you, you, you've joined a cult and you're not Jewish anymore. And I, I remember posing the question, well, but wait a minute, how does a person stop being Jewish when they make the decision to believe in the greatest Jew who ever walked the face of the earth? Amen. And, you know, while it's a good retort, you don't talk back to your parents, even when you're right. <laughs> you got <So> grounded. <laughs> I got grounded. That, that, that really didn't go too far, but that, that's been part of my journey. Okay. And so now, uh, migrating even further, you've, you've matured and you've become a rabbi, mm -hmm. a messianic rabbi. Maybe you can share with all of us, what is a messianic rabbi? Sure. Very, very simply put, a messianic rabbi is a... Jewish rabbi who is skilled in the teachings of the Bible and in the Torah, but, but not but, but and at the same yeah. time has also embraced Yeshua as their Messiah. Say, oh, so they are a Messianic rabbi because they're a rabbi who's recognized the truth of who their Messiah truly is. Now, in full disclosure, Rabbi Jack uh, uh, was the rabbi of a shul synagogue, a Messianic synagogue that I attended for several years, and that's how I met this gentleman. Uh, and then you went on uh, and continued, uh, and then with your schedule with Jewish Voice, traveling the nation and internationally, yes. uh, you had to step down from being a rabbi, I think, a couple of years ago, if I'm not mistaken, a couple of years. That's right. Uh, and, and you're full-time with Jewish Voice out of Phoenix, Arizona, mm -hmm. and you are now traveling. What are you doing representing Jewish Voice? Could you explain to us... Yeah, essentially, uh, I, I travel the world and teach at conferences and universities and churches so that folks can not only understand the Jewish roots or the Jewish foundations of our Christian faith, but so that we can identify with the origins of the Bible and know truly who Jesus is. And at the same time, the other prong of that teaching, as you will, is to recognize the prophetic and salvific importance of the nation of Israel. You know, there are many who think, well, Israel, the vast majority of people who, who, who are there don't believe in God or don't believe in Jesus, and they're occupying Palestinian territory, and there's just so much nonsense and misinformation out there. And so... Part of what I have to do when I go out is to exercise a lot of damage control because people simply don't know. Part of uh, a big, large portion of Arizona today that I've been allowed to do for Prescott E! News is mm -hmm. to discuss the political ramifications of what has happened these past so many months uh, with the, uh, the, the transition, if you will, mm -hmm. uh, from Mr. Trump to, to Mr. Biden. Uh, what do you see traveling the nation and internationally? How is it your view of how uh, Judaism is being viewed today compared to, let's say, 20 years, 30, 40 years ago? What's it, happening? View today from the, the, uh, the, the government standpoint? From the government standpoint. Okay. Where we are now, uh, the, the, look, the journey and the presidential transition took uh, you know, only several days, if you will. But we are now very, very much light years away in terms of, of our government's relationship with Israel than we were during the Trump administration. There were uh, four significant events that happened during the, the, the Trump administration. The moving of the embassy to Jerusalem. The recognition that Jerusalem is the undivided capital of Israel. Uh, the recognition that uh, President Trump had asked Israel to, to uh, hold off for four years on building any more settlements so that possibly there could be a relationship of peace with Israelis and Palestinians. And the, the fourth prong would be that President Trump defunded the Palestinians so that they wouldn't use the monies for, for bombs and rockets to, to launch at innocent Israelis. Um, there has been the transition not only presidentially, but also ideologically with Israel. President Biden is in a very, very different place than President Trump was. Now, they do have agreement in some areas. President Trump said the embassy needs to be, to be in Jerusalem and stay there. President Biden agrees with that, and that's understandable because that belief is actually a carryover from the Obama administration because a lot of folks don't know. President Obama believed the same way that Jerusalem was to be the undivided capital of Israel no questions asked, and therefore the embassy is a statement of that. However, President Biden has said, look, 
we're going to start giving the Palestinians money again. And we want Israel not just to hold off building settlements for four years. We want them to hold off building settlements forever because the Palestinians think that that land belongs to them. And we're telling Israel, stop, don't do anything, because if you build another settlement, you're going to kill any chance or efforts we have to create a two-state solution. And the, the other prong in this, if you will, or the other part of this, is that President Biden also has asked Prime Minister Netanyahu to put a hold on any annexation of lands. Now, let me explain. If you go to Israel, it's almost like a puzzle. You can be on one side of the street, you're in Israel, but yet on the other side of the street, and you know this, you've been there, there's a sign, it's in red, and it basically says, this, you are now entering into an area, and I'll paraphrase this, you are now entering into an area where you better check your life insurance policy because you may get killed. That's true. And it's, it, you know, That's so true. you have these Palestinian areas interspersed with, with Israeli areas. And about a year or so ago, Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu said, look, we need to annex back some of those lands, have them under Israeli control. It's our land according to the Bible. President Biden does not follow that philosophy, and he says, no, no annexation of lands. We want to give the, the two-state solution a chance to work. Here's the problem with that. Israel has given a chance for a two-state solution to work at least 10 times since Israel became a state, and even before, in 1948. Each and every time, the Palestinians said, fine. We're more than happy to have a two-state solution. Here's the deal. We own both states. <laughs> we kick you out of yours because our Quran, we believe, teaches us that all of that land belongs to us. That, my friend, is the root of the Middle East crisis and why it's so hard to solve. It appears to me <clears throat> that over the last so many weeks, uh, almost overnight, uh, there appears to be more of an anti-Semitic environment a beginning to occur in America, mm -hmm. but also an anti-Christian environment. So if you would allow me to separate them, and I'm doing that, ladies and gentlemen, only for the purposes of discussion here today. Uh, there appears to me, and you correct me, Rabbi, that there appears to be uh, a growing anti-Semitism in America and a growing anti-Christian sentiment in America. Mm -hmm. In that sense, Christianity and, and Judaism are pretty equal <laughs> in that sense. Are you seeing that as you travel the nation, that there seems to be a change in the atmosphere? I, I am seeing both, and, and you're right. And there's one thing that's tying both of them together. The common thread is moral relativism. Mm. We're living in this postmodern era where so many people today believe that there is no absolute truth, mm. and truth is what you desire to make it mm. if it falls under the line of human compassion and tolerance. So never mind what the facts say. <laughs> and, and that's a problem, and that's one reason, that's part of the reason that there's been an increase in anti-Semitism here, because Israel is an easy whipping boy for anyone who wants to condemn her, if for no other reason than then there is this mindset and this mantra by professors in universities saying that, well, Israel is stealing Palestinian land and look how horribly these treat they're treating these Palestinians. They might as well be in Tiananmen Square getting ready to be rolled over. Well, let me push you for a second, yeah. Rabbi. I, I accept what you're saying on, on what you just mentioned, but what about from a Christian standpoint? There appears to be uh, beginning to push against Christianity. So is that because the Christians also are standing back, not doing anything, or, or somewhat pusillanimous, meaning wishy-washy? Well, it, you know, inactivity always breeds this type of thing. But I, I think one of the reasons that, that that's starting to happen to Christians as well is because the, and, and I'll say it, the millennial generation in particular is being taught and fed the idea that, that you know, that, that you believe whatever you want that there are many, many different paths to God if, in fact, there is a God. You want to think there is a God? Great. You don't want to think there is a God? Great. No harm done. You want to think you're a tree? You're a tree. You want to think you're not a tree? You're not a tree. And, you know, on the surface, yes, it's laughable, but deep down you realize it's alarming because churches are losing people at an alarming rate. And this is one of the reasons. I, I, I think, and it needs to be said, you know, uh, Folks today are looking not for religion. 
they are looking for spirituality. They're looking for a relationship. Mm -hmm. And I think, not I think, but I know, mm -hmm. they are sick and tired of, of, uh, of, of, let's say, going to certain, not all, but certain churches and, and you know, listening to uh, pastors and some others talk about, uh, you know, we got Starbucks coffee in the lobby and we've got this new building program and, and let's make this like a country club and here comes the light show on. Well, where's God in all of this? And so we wonder, why aren't people gravitating to God anymore? And I think the answer is because we're not giving reasons for them to gravitate to God anymore because we're going out in other directions for reasons of let's bring in as many people as we can and don't preach about, uh, about Christ crucified because you'll upset everybody. And we, we are reaping what we've sown. Jewish voice is on the front line uh, uh, sharing the gospel of Yeshua, Jesus, with Christians and Jews. Am I, do I have that right? That's right. Okay. <clears throat> and as a rabbi, having grown up uh, in a conservative um, shul, synagogue, and, and, and congregation, you have, and then accepting Yeshua, Jesus as the Messiah, as the Messiah, you've got both worlds that have come together in, in your world, in your life, and you are now able to discuss it, share it, uh, preach it, teach it. How's that working? How's that working? How, it, how are you being received? That's great. It, it works to a degree. Yeah. Because, yes, you're right that, that I have these two groups coming together at me. And sometimes when they come together at me, they want to embrace <laughs> me. And sometimes they want to stone me. Um, being in the middle of Messianic Judaism, you're in this interesting paradigm because... The traditional Jewish community oftentimes doesn't understand why you've accepted Jesus and they reject you. And many times the traditional church doesn't understand you because they think, well, wait a minute, you're a believer in Jesus, but you're still identifying with Judaism. Oh my gosh, you're going back under the law. What's wrong with you? We don't want to have anything to do with you. Keep your distance. We don't need that legalism. And so, you know, oh Lord, please don't let me be misunderstood. <laughs> and that's, that's oftentimes where we're at. Where do you see America, let's say, six months from now or even a year from now? Mm -hmm. Just give a guess uh, I in relationship to what we're talking about. Of here. course. I, you know, I, I see us hopefully in, in a couple of areas. I see us hopefully coming out of COVID. I see us hopefully coming out of, of conspiracy theories and, and Christians who should have the discernment that God tells them to get to test the spirits in 1 John 4, hopefully moving away from believing everything they hear and rather than focusing on the tangential, such as, uh, well, uh, you know, gee, if I watch this program, I'll get this, or if I do this, I'll get that, or, or let's see, is this one the Antichrist, or that one the Antichrist? I, I think our minds have gotten off the ball, and I'm hoping that in a short time, in particular, we who are believers in Jesus will say, wait a minute, this is all a distraction from the enemy. We've been focusing on, you know, whether it's a Mayan calendar in 2012, or this is going to happen, or this is going to happen, wait a minute. Uh, or, or maybe we should buy a parcel of land in St. John's and, 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 you know, dig six feet under and have air conditioning in case the world blows up. Or maybe we should buy guns. I'm like, wait a minute. What about sharing the gospel? What about getting out the good news? Because if indeed we're really in those times, isn't the most important thing for us to do is to share the word of God to bring people to salvation? We have forgotten that. We have lost that. And I'm hoping that in the next six months, I'm thinking it may be more, but God can do anything, that we're going to start to get back to that important route where we should have been all along. Outstanding. Thank you, Rabbi. Welcome. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, this has been unusual uh, given what we've discussed over the last several weeks with the recalls, with the uh, election fraud, uh, and what's taking place uh, politically. And yet this is very much in tune with all of that. And I know that Rabbi uh, is willing to come back and, and hopefully in the next so many couple of weeks here, uh, you'll be able to share some more of what you just finished sharing <clears throat> and enlighten us as to what you're seeing across this nation and across the world 
as how political leaders of all persuasions are now viewing Christians and Jews, if Amen. you would be willing to do that. Be delighted to. Thank you, Rabbi, very much. Ladies right. and gentlemen, uh, this has been Rabbi Jack with Jewish Voice uh, International, and they're out of Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, and Rabbi Jack is, uh, Zimmerman has been willing to come back and, and share some more insight with us uh, from both a Jewish perspective and a Christian perspective, which really, in my opinion, I think Rabbi and I agree, are one and the same. Uh, so ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm Lyle Rapaki, reporting in Prescott, Arizona for Prescott E! News, and that's how I see Arizona today.